March 18, 1990, the most audacious art heist of all time took place at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Check out season one of Empty Frames for a 12-episode dive into the Gardner heist. This season, we will be exploring other art crimes and significant moments in the art world before returning to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist. This is Empty Frames. Welcome back to Empty Frames. I'm Tim, here today in the Crawl Space Studios with Lance. What's up, Lance? How's it going today? Going great. Good. We had a wonderful reaction from episode one of Empty Frames season two. Of course, those guys, Buck and David from Manzanita Ridge Furniture and Antiques in Silver City, New Mexico. Everyone seemed to love them. And how could you not? Because what they did with the stolen woman ochre painting by de Kooning, they unintentionally purchased that. They realized they had a, an original. They realized they had a stolen painting and they returned it and they didn't want any money back. Which actually had no real precedence. The, the FBI was confused, and we're, we have a clip that we're going to play before we get to the interview today with our subject, Barbara Shapiro. But the FBI didn't know how to deal with them wanting no reward and wanting to return this stolen painting. So that is kind of why this uh, series of events happened how it did, and you'll hear about it in the clip that we're about to play. It is a really cool story to hear because, like you said, there was no real protocol on the FBI's part to figure out, are these guys going to drop the hammer on us and, and demand a reward or do something else with the painting, perhaps destroy it? So instead of rushing in and and perhaps you know spooking them to the point where they would destroy it, because they didn't know who these guys were, they went through this whole thing behind the scenes and... It's 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 comical now, but you have David who was waiting up all night with a gun by his side because he hadn't heard back from anybody, and he knew that people knew he had this painting. And so it's it's a it's a fascinating like sort of behind the scenes, behind the curtain look at the whole thing. And this clip that we're about to play is sort of a leftover from the interview that we did for episode one. It just didn't really make the cut. So, uh, but we thought it was interesting enough to play here. So let's hear it now. Thank you all for reaching out, and if you end up having more questions, feel free to reach out. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, the, the FBI will be probably in about another 10 to 15 days will be making the announcement, their wow. findings. It's, it's going to the FBI will be announcing uh, officially what their findings are in, in about 10 to 15 days. Oh, perfect. So Very we, cool. what it was, we, we finally signed our rights away to the painting um, October 20th. And um, we had 30 days from that date to change our minds, and then if we don't, then they announce. So it'll be 30 oh. days from October 20th. They're gonna, they'll are gonna, they be releasing the their findings on this case, and then they'll close the case. So there's still time. There's still time it to change be, minds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're, we're talking, after we hang up with you, guys have kind of convinced us to think about it. Maybe $100 <laughs> million, dollars, no, guys. We don't want that reputation. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> but, well, the timing well. should be really good, because this, uh, this episode is going live on the 20th. Yep. It'll be, uh, oh, yep. Episode that one might be, they may, that may be the day they announce. So it'll be, it'll be cool. Very See. cool. Fascinatingly, like with the FBI, um, they've actually trained or changed how they train in the FBI office for this because they've never had this hmm. happen. Oh. So wow. they themselves didn't know how to, they didn't understand how this was going to work out. So they did change that. They well, also, and one of the reasons they changed it, if you remember in the story, when I told you, I, I looked up their website and I had to email them. Yeah. They put a phone. They, number. they read that e the art, the FBI art theft team read that email three days after the museum picked up the painting. Right. So oh. they decided they, they needed to change the way they did things. So change is good. At the university of Arizona, I spoke to an FBI agent that um, was part of that, the, the, that team. She had just retired. And she's the one who told me that because of uh, my email to them, they're they're reworking their entire uh, art theft team, the the way they handle things. So. That is excellent. Yeah, good, good. job. You yeah. deserve a, a junior detective <laughs> I, uh, FBI I, badge. I I agree. And you know, the University of Arizona sends me a baseball cap every once in a while. I think yeah, I think the, yeah. the FBI should send me another another FBI cap too because it's been <laughs> over a year. I, I think I deserve another one. 
<laughs> send your hand me downs to us. And all the memorabilia. Send it our way. We'll take yep. it. <laughs> We, we beg for we beg for that kind of stuff. Come on, send us send us. Give me, give me a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> never never have enough t-shirts. Yeah. That's right. Um, hey, do you still have the recording of Olivia? Is it Olivia? Do you still have the recording of Olivia when you? I, I should. I have that one, and then another video that I took that night because it was getting hairy with David and the attorneys, uh, with the attorney. And at one point, I actually went back into the room by myself with the painting. And I made a video that uh, was basically telling the world what our intentions were because I didn't want anybody to to misconstrue what we were trying to do. So I, I put this video and like tried to post it to Facebook that evening, and it wouldn't load and it wouldn't load and it wouldn't load. And um, finally, it it loaded when the painting was returned. I don't know if the FBI had something, you know, to do with it not loading. Oh. Uh, but the video finally did load and finally did hit YouTube um, ab about, you know, me just saying, this is what we want to do. This is the painting. This is what happened. Yeah, you guys yeah. should look that up. It's kind of it's kind of it's kind fun. of fun. Hey, guys. Sorry. Question. Uh, do you know what a hundred plus million dollars looks like? I didn't either until I bought that. Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, we purchased an estate. And in the estate was this piece. Uh, we found out that it had uh, more than likely been stolen over 30 years ago. Uh, we've contacted the previous owner of who it was stolen from, and we're giving it back. Uh, it's great that we have this opportunity to be a part of history. Uh, great piece of artwork. I'm in love with it. Uh, my only regret is I didn't get to hang it on my wall, uh, but it needs to go back to its rightful owner. It's a beautiful piece. I'm thrilled that the three of us, David, Rick, and I, uh, Manzanita Ridge, uh, Silver City, New Mexico, all my friends that are here with us tonight, um, we get an opportunity to authenticate this bad boy. I think it's called Ochre Woman or Woman Ochre. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I know I love it. That just means I have exceptional taste at over $100 million, right? Yeah. So if I get to you on the street and I tell you that you look good, it's because I mean it. Okay, so that's some follow-up on that interview. I think that's pretty interesting stuff. And just as interesting, Lance, is our guest today. What else is interesting? B.A. Shapiro. So B.A. Shapiro wrote a book called The Art Forger, and this is something that we what had been on our radar in season one of Empty Frames when we were talking about the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist because The Art Forger is about that heist, but she weaves a bit of fiction into it and creates these characters. Uh, Claire Roth, who's a struggling artist, gets an original Degas, and it is to be returned to the Gardner Museum, but not without several twists and turns and a lot of uh, in-town references in Boston. And Barbara was uh, just really crafted together a, a, a real masterful story, I'd say. Yeah, and she's great to talk to, and she's very well versed in art and the world of art forgery, especially because of writing this book and her other books involve art as well. She also has a PhD in sociology, so she's uh, pretty smart and uh, really kind of the, the exact person that we ought to be having a conversation like this with. When we're talking about art forgery and what makes like this painting, even to Kooning's women series of work, what makes those significant and how are those more significant than a solid reproduction? Also, what's the difference between a reproduction and a forgery? Right. And why is one valuable and one not? So I think all those questions are really good. And that really is kind of what we're diving into here in season two, this kind of bridge season where we're kind of just taking a glance around the whole world of stolen art. Yes, and Barbara's additional work also has to do with the art world, and we recommend that people check that out as well. She has The Muralist, and she has The Collector's Apprentice, and, of course, The Art Forger, and all of those stories are very... Like, I keep saying they're really well-crafted stories. She, she writes the way one would paint. So check those out at bashapirobooks.com, and there is a link in the show notes. So thank you very much for listening, and we hope you enjoy this episode. We will be back in two weeks with another really interesting interview. And if you're a fan of Banksy and if you're a fan of the stunt he pulled at Sotheby's Auction, be sure to check out this episode. Follow us on Twitter at empty underscore frames, and we're on Instagram and Facebook as well. Thank you very much.
Welcome to Empty Frames. I'm Tim here today with Lance, and uh, we are being joined by the author of The Art Forger, Barbara Shapiro. How, how are you, Barbara? I'm just great. How are you guys? We are doing wonderful. Uh, we want to thank you for coming on and uh, joining us here in our Crawl Space studio by way of fa- uh, FaceTime. Uh, it is a nasty day outside. It's probably the first day of the nine months of uh, perpetual cold and wetness. <laughs> nine so, months. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> There's a lovely thought. <laughs> yeah. So not to bring everybody down, but that's what's going to happen. I'm not, you know, I'm not speaking out of school here. Winter is coming, Lance. Winter is finally here. But anyway, thank you so much for coming on. You're in the middle of, before we get into the, uh, your book, The Art Forger, you're in the middle of a tour right now for your new book. Is that right? I am. Okay. You want to, yeah, you can, you can, you're, you're going to rock it to superstardom after being on the show. <laughs> oh, yes. So. Okay. So I might as well plug my book while I got the chance. Do it. Do it. <laughs> so uh, my new book is called The Collector's Apprentice. And like The Art Forger and my last book, The Muralist, it's about art and history and there's a mystery at its core and it has some sex and other things thrown in there. And it takes place in the 1920s and it is about the post-impressionists. Matisse is the love interest in the book, and uh, the characters are hanging out in Gertrude Stein's salon with Matisse and Picasso and uh, Hemingway and Fitzgerald. And it's a story about um, a con man, uh, very, very clever, uh, very, very evil con man, probably the favorite character I've ever created i love him and i hate him and (laughs) i'm just fascinated by the workings of his mind and by the emptiness of his soul and uh so it explores the world of the 1920s in paris and in philadelphia and the development of post-impressionism while also having a couple of love triangles a murder cons and counter cons and more counter cons wow (laughs) So uh, it just came out a few weeks ago, and I've been on tour and continue to be on tour. And I got my fingers crossed that people are going to like it. That's awesome. How do you, even with the Art Forger, where you have these uh, twists and turns, and it sounds like there's more in in your current book, how do you, do you you ever have to take a step back and just like untangle the web for a little bit and and figure things out in your own head? Um, I'd say many, many times. Um, I write, uh, I'm a a rewriter and, uh, every page of this book and the art forger have probably been rewritten 20 times, uh, five, six, seven, eight major drafts because I can't, I think this is true of most novelists unless they're absolutely brilliant. Uh, there's just so many things that you have to juggle in a novel the uh, the themes, the characters, the plot, the words, the subplots. Um, and of course, I make it hard for myself by creating these more intricate plots. And then I also jump around in time and uh, do things to make my life even more complicated than necessary. <laughs> well, writing is rewriting, right? That's exactly it. That's what I tell my classes. If you don't want to rewrite, then you might as well just leave right now. (laughs) That's right. I feel like that's a good um, way to look at planning an art heist, too. If you you don't want to get caught, you need to replan and replan. Although, I don't know. Is that... Do you think that's the case with the Gardner heist? Oh, what a good segue. That was unintentional. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I I mean, because the Gardner heist, you you could really take either side of that i think you know you you could be like oh this was spontaneous uh or pretty spontaneous you know they cut these things out uh and then you could look at it uh, you know they got police uniforms they had somewhat disguises they may have known someone who worked at the museum and the duration how long Mm -hmm. it's been since they haven't been caught and and how long they were in the museum and how long they're in the museum we we've talked about this in the early episodes of season one ad nauseum ad nauseum (laughs) where (laughs) where it when you first start looking at the gardner heist the 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 first thing you think is bumbling thieves i think there's even articles written that say bumbling thieves and because they used a brutal method to take the art out of the frames and because they left the place in disarray but 
people who bumble don't typically get away with something for almost 30 years. So it's a weird, did they do it to make it look like they were bumbling and they knew it the whole time, or is it luck? Um, do you want my theory? Yeah, please. Yeah, sure. My theory is that it actually was bumbling and that it did have to do with the guard who admitted to being stoned every time he was <laughs> he was at work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was a young guy and a musician and clearly into all kinds of stuff. And he had bragged about how easy it would be to break in there. And there were signs that there had been a dress rehearsal the night before. And I kind of think that maybe it just was a lark. And they went in there and they grabbed the paintings and then they drove away in their rusted out old hatchback and looked in the back and went, oh, now what do we do? (laughs) And, you know, that it was because it was so bumbling that they were able to get away with it. But of course, you know, I don't know any better than anybody else knows, so. But that that creates an an impossible problem, it seems like, to solve, right? Like you have these art pieces. How do you liquidize them? How do you get paid for them? Well, you know, I mean, you can use them. They are used on the black market as collateral. But if it was bumbling, then that's not what happened. What I fear happened is that they destroyed them. Do you have the address? To the black market. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was wondering how to locate the black market because I hear yeah, the black market, but yeah, I don't get it. It's like, www.blackmarket.com. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, uh, yeah, there's sub sub menus where you can go to uh, art forgery, art right. heist, and dark web, though. It leads you to the dark, dark web. web. Yeah. yeah, I've heard that too. But I think that, you know, if it was the mafia, as some people say, um, or it was somebody who had planned it and maybe even planned it so well, they wanted to make it look like it was bumbling, they would know how right. to get black market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it really does break my heart to think about bumbling thieves saying, I, we can't do anything with this. It's too dangerous. And then they just sink it in the Charles or something. Like that's... Well, you're you're talking about art crimes. Um, there was an instance. I think was it was it in Amsterdam? I can't remember exactly where it was, but a guy had gone in and stolen a bunch of very very valuable paintings and hidden them in his mother's house. Have you heard about this? And to protect him, she burned them. Oh, she totally and completely. She just burned them in the fireplace. And the cops came in and they found the burned remnants of those paintings because she thought that that would that way her son couldn't be incriminated. Man, what kind of uh, sentence does one get for that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But it's, it, you know, there's there's all kinds of fascinating art crimes going on. Do you, do you mean a sentence for burning them or a sentence for for stealing them? I guess for destroying them. Okay, so it's not a legal sentence, right? Would that be a moral sentence that you'd get? I don't know. I don't know. Well, what do you? Well, let's see. She did destroy property that didn't belong to her, mm. so that could be legal. Uh, could illegal. be like an accomplice. Like she's guilty by. I don't know if that's a thing. Guilty by association. Well, but she actually destroyed it. He stole it. Yeah. So he's guilty of theft, but. She's guilty of theft of stolen property, guilty of, of destroying stolen property. I don't know. Yeah, I guess if she knew it was stolen, then that's yeah. really the crime there. So, yeah, she's definitely guilty Which of something. She did, yeah. yeah. Lock her up. Lock her up and throw Lock away the key. Lock her up, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, so, so, why the art world? Why are you fascinated with uh, this subject? I am. A, an art lover. When I was a little girl, I wanted to be an artist. Uh, and my parents were really supportive. And they, my father set up a little studio for me in the corner of the basement, and they sent me to art classes. But unfortunately, it became clear pretty early on that this was not where my talents lay. So I became an art appreciator. And I travel a lot for work and pleasure. And I, the first thing I do in every city is go to the art museums. And I just stumbled onto the idea for the art forger. We had just moved to Boston. And as a, an art lover, I started going to all of the museums. And uh, I mean, I'd been to the Gardner many times, but 
you know, I went again and started thinking about Bell Gardner, who I'd always been fascinated with, and, you know, the heist, which I had also always been fascinated with, and started to write what was a fictionalized biography of Bell Gardner. But that it just didn't work right. Uh, I just couldn't get my, my head around it. So then I added in the heist. But that wasn't enough either. And then I stumbled into art forgery. And that's what pulled the whole thing together. And I, like both of you, just became fascinated with all of the details of this, you know, like the art forgers and, you know, who are they and why do they do it and how do they do it? And what happens when they get caught or more interesting, what happens when they don't get caught? Then, you know, that book was my breakout book and it was clear that people love books about art. So I wrote The Muralist, which takes place in the late 1930s and is about the abstract expressionists. And then I just finished The Collector's Apprentice, which is about the post-impressionists. And I figure I've given, gotten a master's degree in art writing these three books. So I can give myself, I, I can call myself an art historian. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. An, an honorary uh, doctorate. Yeah. yeah, right. There you go. Well you, well, you did become an artist, in fairness, just not a painter. Right. Not a, yes, right. Not a visual artist. Yeah. So but, so good uh, on your parents. What I wanted. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But good on your parents for, uh, for encouraging you uh, in that field. So that's really cool. We really love the way you wove together the fictionalized account of your hero in the book, uh, Claire, with the heist and the the Degas, which you created as well. The the Degas from your book is not an actual painting that was stolen from the from the gardener. But I think it would I think it probably would have hit a little too close to home if you had said she was trying to do a forgery of the Storm on the Sea of Galilee. Exactly. Right. And and Degas just felt more fitting for your character to relate with and you even tied it in with the the letters from Isabella yeah. Stewart Gardner. So I guess my long-winded question is, how did you develop Claire? How did you use Isabella Stewart Gardner's characteristics in Claire, or did you? And what what gave what, what where did you uh, come up with the decision to um, to include these letters from the past? Well, the letters were you know one of the most fun parts of the book, writing those letters. Um, I had read, you know, pretty much every biography of Belle Gardner that there was. And on her deathbed, she burned every letter that she had. And she ordered all of her correspondents to burn all the letters from her. And the only person who didn't burn the letters was Bernard Berenson. And there's one book that contains their letters. So I used their letters, her writing style to come up with my own fictional letters, uh, which was really fun. That was, that was really, really fun. Uh, Claire came to me kind of uh, semi-fully formed. Um, there's a lot of autobiographical personal things about her and her career. I had, I had published five books that, had, that were published by major publishers, uh, HarperCollins, Avon Books, and um, nobody read them. And then I wrote four books that I couldn't even get published. So when I sat down to write The Art Forger, I was sitting exactly where Claire was sitting at the beginning of the book with a career kind of in shatters. Uh, obviously, I didn't have all of the, you know, the heavy baggage that she had, but I understood all too well the frustrations of an artist who is not able to make it in the world. And that was her genesis. As far as the heist went, I knew that I couldn't solve it. And I also knew that it was going to take me three or four years to write this book. And I didn't want to write a book that if it did get solved in the interim, then I wouldn't be able to get published. Right. That's where the fake painting came from. And, you know, indeed, I didn't solve the heist. <laughs> you know, in the it's book. okay. You can tell us. This is all confidential. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you solve the heist, you can tell us. That's totally fine. I noticed yeah. you did a, a wink and this motion with your finger on your nose. So I don't know if that's a <laughs> signal, but to the listeners out there, bombshell. 
<laughs> uh, so w- what about forgery uh, compels you to uh, to talk about and write about? Well, first of all, I just, you know, I, I just fell for all these art forgers and, you know, I read up on all of them and all of these people. And, uh, you know, one of the most common traits in these forgers is that they have been rejected by the art world and they decide they're going to prove to the art world how good they are by forging someone else's paintings and get them accepted as real. This makes no sense whatsoever when you think about it. <laughs> But that is, you know, one of the big motivations. And I started thinking about forgery and I started thinking about the trouble that Claire was into uh, because of what she had done with her boyfriend's painting. And I started thinking about a world where you can't really be sure of what's real and what isn't real. And that's way before now when we have no idea what's truth and what isn't true. And so I started to play around with that. And then thinking about the forgers, I thought about, you know, what are the lengths that people will go to to get what they want? So once I thought that question, then suddenly it's so, okay, what are the lengths Claire will go to to get what she wants? What are the lengths Aiden, who is the, um, the gallery owner who convinces her to forge a painting, what are the lengths he will go to? What are the lengths Bell Gardner will go to? What are the lengths that, you know, her great, great niece will go to? Um, and so all of that came in and started, you know, just, just insinuating itself into the book. And then with draft after draft, I started pulling it out more and more and more and trying to get it into every character, which also was fun. So before we uh, get too deep into that, because there's a little bit to unpack there, I have a bunch of other questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you give a, a, a synopsis of the of the Art Forger for anyone who hasn't read it? As I said, I've written four books since then, so can I even remember? Uh, it's the story of Claire Roth, and she is a struggling artist, and she has been blackballed by the art community because of something she did, which was not the best thing in the world to do, but she did it with the right intentions, as quite often these things happen. And she gets approached by the biggest art gallery owner in Boston, and he says, if you will forge a painting for me, her job is to do reproductions of paintings, and her specialty is Degas. And she gets paid. This is a, you know, this, this is real. Uh, there's a website that she works for called reproductions.com. And people ask for reproductions. They want high quality reproductions of masterworks. And that's how she makes her living. And he says, if you will forge a painting for me, I will give you your own one woman show in Boston. And then he tells her that the painting is a painting that was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner heist. And that he has it and he's a good guy and he wants the forgery so that he can ultimately give it back. And so she agrees to do it and much trouble ensues. As you'd imagine. So, yeah. So he wants her to to paint a a sort of a replica so he can sell that and then return the original to the museum. That's what he says. Right. Right. So but but you can see how there's some kind of uh, ethical questions. There's a bit of a rub there (laughs) for Claire. Yeah. Yeah. There there are moral questions pretty much for everybody. Um, I'm actually a sociologist. I have a Ph.D. in sociology because all writers need a PhD in sociology. That's great. Um, And I used to, I taught at Tufts and I used to teach a class called Deviance. And it was about, you know, particular societies and how they defined who's deviant and under what conditions, you know, one act is considered deviant where the same act under other conditions is not. And um, I, I was thinking about, you know, the morality of, these these issues and how people, you know, again, the lengths people will go to to get what they want and where the line of morality is. You know, um, we, you know, we we break rules every day. That time you go through the red light, that time you tell the white lie. Um, and but 
But where where is that? And most of us, including the most deviant amongst us, a, a serial murderer, 95 percent acts the same way a regular person does, calls his mother on Sunday and goes food shopping and all of this. So those moral questions um, of where where that line is and where you're going to cross it, I wanted people to think about. I also wanted people to think about this whole issue of celebrity, which again, this was before now, um, in a society where if your name is Kardashian, you have a lot of value. Um, but if you're a school teacher or a librarian, you have very little. So where does value come from? And then that gets back to the forgery. You know, why is a forgery not valuable? If it looks exactly the same, why you know, why isn't it? And where does value lie? Right. And if the artist is as talented or perhaps very close to as talented as the original artist, wh what is the line there? Right. And right. what we're that doing right now is what your characters do in the book where um, I, one, one review called uh, the morality in your book elusive. There was an, I think it was the New York Times, right? Yeah. Said, uh, it, it had elusive morality, which is cool. All of your characters have that. And we're doing the same thing by saying, well, but why not? Why, what if? What if? And um, the art dealer, Markel, said, basically in the beginning just shrugs off like because, I mean, the biggest the biggest problem that that Claire would anticipate is you're going to sell uh, my forgery to someone who's buying it. What when what happens when they find out? And it sort of shrugged off like, well, isn't that a good trade off to put the original back in its home? So that's so you're even and this is a criminal who would be buying what they think is a stolen a stolen painting. So what maybe, are they going to do? Maybe they don't deserve the refund on the couple million or whatever. Right. Rationalization is a powerful force. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's that's pretty impressive that that just happened here when you said, <laughs> like, well, if they're just as good, what's the difference? I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a it's very elusive. it's a very interesting topic. I think I was giving a talk once at the uh, Clark Museum out in Western Mass, and this got brought up in the Q and A. And somebody in the audience asked this question, and an artist stood up on the other side of the auditorium and said, "It is plagiarism. It is." My idea, my plan, I did this. That's why it's not worth any of this. And, and so it went back and forth between the audience members, which was really cool. But I had to side with the artist, that's for sure. Yeah, it is plagiarism. It's, it's the artist's idea. But what makes that idea and that version of you know, their idea valuable, whereas the art forger who tried their original work, their work isn't valuable? And also, a lot of these art forgers do a pastiche, a painting that looks like a painting that a particular artist would have made, and they look for empty places in their, um, in their body of work, and then often paint a painting that didn't exist, that wasn't a direct copy, but it is presented as an authentic piece of Michelangelo's work. And so there, it actually is an original painting. It isn't an exact replica. That is interesting. And it, it reminds me of uh, of doing a podcast about a certain topic and then having another company do the same topic and presenting it as an original. That's strange. Oh. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't plagiarism. know what you're getting at, Lance. <laughs> now, plagiarism, uh, bad luck, bad timing. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing that really kind of interests me about this is so the forger, right? It's not like it's not like you can just paint a, a portrait or paint a picture in in a day or whatever. It, it, it takes weeks, months, a lot of time, years sometimes. So this person, this forger, is constantly returning to add to this. So they're making the conscious decision to do this illegal act, essentially, or at least immoral act, every single time they pick up their paintbrush. So uh, That's fascinating to me. It's the depth of premeditation. Yeah. And the continuation of premeditation. But I think once somebody has made the decision to cross the line, that it's easier every time to just do it again and again and again. And then we also get back to rationalization. So human animal is wonderful at rationalizing their motives, perceiving themselves uh, as the hero in their story. This is something as a fiction writer, you have to recognize that 
even the bad guys think they're the good guys. So when you write them, you have to write them from their point of view that, you know, like Markel, you know, he perceived himself as a good guy. Everybody does. Mm-hmm. No one wants to think of themselves as bad. Yeah. You even have a great moment in the book where Claire is at the um, Museum of Fine Art and she keeps accidentally setting off the alarms because she's getting too close to the paintings. And she she makes an internal comment about the guard watching her and and thinking, doesn't this guard have more dangerous people to, to look for <laughs> other than her? And then she says, actually, she's probably the most dangerous criminal in there considering what she's doing. <laughs> she's like reconning. But still she went back and did it. Right, yeah. right. So it's the adrenaline too. I love the story of an anti-hero like that. She oh, had, yeah. She had no desire to do that. You know, she was never in the criminal world intentionally. She, everything she did was for, um, had the best intentions. Mm. Now, wh- wh- why is this topic kind of romantic? Right. I feel like uh, that word kind of comes up occasionally and art heists and uh, even forgery. It, it, and in your book is is romantic as well. And just the entire topic just seems like uh, there's so much passion, I guess, involved. Is that is that what it is? What what do you think? You know, that's interesting. That's a good question. Um, I think art is very mysterious to a lot of people and like for me i can't comprehend how anybody can create a a great piece of art because obviously it's way beyond my capabilities and i think we imbue and maybe this goes back to the celebrity stuff you know we imbue art and artists with this mystique the same way we do movie stars or politicians and so then everything about it becomes you know higher and higher and gets to a higher and higher volume. Um, I'm not sure, but it is. Everything about art is more romantic. Um, People just are taken in by it. Bell Gardner said that art is what makes a culture immortal, the art that is created by that culture at that moment. And maybe that's part of it too, is uh, recognition on some level that this, this is us. <laughs> mm. you know? Yeah. I think that's interesting. Yeah. I also think like there, there's something kind of romantic about the idea of heists or, or like cat burglary or like dancing around like these lasers, like Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but that no, isn't yeah. really what happened in, at least in the Gardner case. Like there's like nothing romantic about that actual story. Um, these, these tough guys uh, came in with probably a box cutter. Like that's, there's nothing like polite or romantic about that. Actually, the drunk history version is probably more closer to the truth than the <laughs> Catherine Zeta Jones version. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. Um, but what is romantic is the idea that they did this to a museum that had no insurance and bad security. And I mean, it, it is the largest art heist ever in the world and it is definitely the biggest unsolved art heist so that starts to imbue it over the years with romantic tinges and you know i mean they took you know rembrandt's only seascape they took a vermeer i think he only has 37 paintings that he made i mean that that's that's romantic too these are great names in our history and if there is an underground, which there probably is, I mean, that reputation that you have, if you're inviting, you know, your underground buddies over and you can pull back the curtain and say, that's the original concert by Vermeer. I mean, that the, the, the reputation might be worth the, the cost of the painting. People that would do that, we as ordinary people can't really comprehend. Um, it's like, you know, these incredibly rich people who then cheat their companies to get even richer, you know, and we look at it and it's like, you've already got a hundred million dollars. Why would you cheat to get um, like the Japanese guy? I can't remember which Nissan. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, why? 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 You know, so I think their motivations like to show this off to their friends, to be big, to be bigger, you know, are almost beyond the comprehension of average people. <laughs> yeah, because we'll never be put in that position. I'm, you know, yeah, you right. speak for yourself. Well, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I know it's very intimidating for you to be talking to us. And that's oh, yes. <laughs> but, uh, 
Tim and I are just regular guys. We put our pants on one leg at a time, just like everyone <laughs> yeah, else. That's it. And me too. You know, um, that's how the genes go on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're human. Um, you did a ton of research on the process of forging, on the paint and because we hear this all the time, especially if you're interested in art heist. And then, you know, what if you're buying a forgery? How do you how do you test that? How do you see it? The cracks in it and all that. Did you ever feel like you were doing something wrong when you were researching <laughs> how to do that? Where you're like, I shouldn't have this knowledge. <laughs> I shouldn't have this Google history. Oh, yeah, exactly. Clear your browser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people have told me that if you're an artist and you read this book, you can go on to be a successful forger. <laughs> Because I lack any kind of talent, I never felt I was doing anything illegal. And one of the major sources for the information outside of all of these biographies of all of these different um, art forgers was a book called uh, The Art Forger's Handbook. And it was written by an art forger. And half of the book was about how you do a reproduction. So here's the painting, and this is what you do to have a Degas um, that, you know, looks somewhat like a day God that you can hang in your living room. And the other half of the book was how you forge the painting so that you can fool the experts and what are the tricks that they are going to, what are the things they're going to be looking for and how do you trick them? And, you know, again, it was like, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the difference between an imitation and a forgery? Well, the technical legal difference is that anybody, I mean, you go into museums and you see people doing it all the time. Anybody can copy a painting. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's when you go out to sell it as the original, then it becomes the crime of forgery. Um, you could think you were doing a forgery and then it doesn't come out that well, so you don't sell it. So then it's a reproduction. There's nothing you know, the act itself isn't the forgery. It's the sale of it as an original work that it becomes a forgery. Okay, so tricking someone, basically, is, is the right. part. Yeah. How, how many forgeries do you think are hanging in museums? Or I guess what percentage of artwork in museums are actual forgeries, do you think? Well, there are estimates of anywhere from, you know, 20% to 50%. Uh, nobody knows for sure. The reason the numbers may be so high is because in hundreds of years ago, these old masters, they had ateliers and they had students. And so Michelangelo had all of these students. And sometimes if he needed money, he would take something a student had done and sign his name to it. And then it was a Michelangelo. And this was common practice. It wasn't considered forgery at that time. So a lot of these old paintings, they can't be sure who actually painted them. And it's, uh, there also is an estimate that something like 30% of all the paintings that are going on sale at Christie's and, and, you know, major auction houses also are forgeries. The technique, since I wrote The Art Forger, which was six years ago, the techniques have gotten better and better at being able to tell, but also the forgers have gotten more and more clever. And so they're, you know, it's, they're, they're catching up with what, or that actually probably they're one step ahead. How would I make paint appear to be 200 years old? Well, the first thing that you have to do is make sure there are no ingredients in that paint that were developed in the last 200 or 300 years. Oh, that's easy. Everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah. And in the olden days, a lot of the painters, they made their own paints. You know, it wasn't like they could go to the store and buy a tube of paint. So the most important thing about the paint is that you do not use any ingredients in it that were not available two or 300 years ago. Modern paints are full of uh, chemicals that didn't exist at that time. So that's, that's the first thing you do is you figure out exactly what it was and then you, you try to get it. Some of it is very difficult to get. The other issue is that I read this 
Um, and I haven't, I, it hasn't been verified, but it does make sense to me that after Chernobyl, there, you know, that spewed all kinds of radiation into the atmosphere. And that you can tell that the people that are checking on this can tell things that happened before Chernobyl or after by the amount of radiation contained in the paint. Yeah, okay. I don't wow. know if that's true, but there, so there are many things like that that you have to do. And then there's the aging of, um, you have to use wood that was, you know, you have to use a frame and canvas and uh, that was used at that time. Um, I have in the art forger, she actually scrapes the paint off of an old painting that, um, and then paints over it so that the wood and the canvas are from that time. Cause you can tell that. And then she has to bake the painting to make the cracks that will also make it look old. So there's a series of steps that you have to go through in order to try to fool the experts. How long do you bake a painting for? Is it is there an instruction <laughs> on that, like 425 for like 25 minutes? Yes, there, there actually was. <laughs> it's a lot like And there's Hello a certain Fresh. amount of time, and that's why she had to get her big oven um, and, uh, you know, bake the huge canvases and watch it and watch the cracks appear. And then she had to cover it with ink so she could get black soot into the cracks. Uh, it's a very complicated process. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Lance, how would you uh, go about making uh, your paint? Would you would you go to Chernobyl? You, you'd uh, like go, <laughs> go through the forest and pick out like these berries? Or, or I think my first call would be to Barbara. And then I'd figure out where to go from there. Well, here we are. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, now, how would you go about recreating this red lake pigment? Right. Like, just yeah. I guess, I guess, if we can just try the thought exercise, because this really happened in the Gardner case. Uh, there was a a shade of red that was recreated, uh, or or potentially original, but that was. Uh, apparently used by Rembrandt and Vermeer. During their time. During that time. Yep. Uh -huh. So some of this red lake that was specific to that time was sent in sort of as a proof of life, uh, saying, hey, we have these paintings, but the, there's no way to know if that was real to those paintings or some other painting exactly. created around that time. So. So I guess my question is like, how would you, if you were going to recreate Red Lake using ingredients from only 200 and 300 years ago, how the, where the hell would you start? You know, I think the the simplest answer to that is you go get a bunch of old paintings and you scrape the paint off. Yeah, yeah, some old and, uh, like lesser, uh, right? Lesser, I guess, quality. You know, not as expensive because you're not going to do one brand, Rembrandt for another Rembrandt. You're going to do right. what Claire yeah, did. Right, exactly. Some lesser artists that you can get a hold of. Um, I don't know if that would work. Well, we'll let you know. <laughs> no, we won't, Yeah, Lance. let me know. Let me know. <laughs> so you have a background in art, which I guess makes my next question, uh, it's maybe half an answer on that, but was it ever intimidating when you decided that writing about fine art was uh was going to be your in your wheelhouse where because oh. i feel like you can i feel like one could go so wrong so fast by saying or writing the wrong thing just due to you know the abundance of information or misinformation were you intimidated oh absolutely very very intimidated and when i started the art forger i really knew very little about art except what I had picked up as an art appreciator. And I, I have a lot of friends who are artists. And the first thing that I did when I started working on the book was go to a number of artists. And there were three of them in particular who were just great. And they let me sit in their studios and watch them work and talk to me and explain things to me. When I first started working on this book. I didn't know that in classical painting techniques, you had to do layer after layer and have them dry between the layers. And that that was the way you got the luminescence in the paint. This is how little I knew at the beginning. And then I had those artists uh, read my drafts and tell me what I had that was right and wrong. 
And then I, I went and I spoke with gallery owners and uh, had them read my drafts to make sure that I was getting this right. Because in the day, you know, in this time of uh, Amazon and, and Goodreads and Google, you know, people can get a hold of you and they will tell you what they are sure you got wrong. No. <laughs> I know. It's hard to believe. You know, it's mostly like, get a life. <laughs> okay. A novel. So, so in your, uh, in exploring the uh, inner workings of the, of the art culture, you visited an artist. Your main character also works in a, um, in a youth, I guess it's a detention center. Uh, uh-huh. yep. So, so. Did you did you go to detention centers to see how uh, how how inmates there interacted? I did. Oh. Um, there's a character in the detention center who works there who is a social worker and she works with the boys. And I have a niece who is a social worker who at the time worked with boys in detention centers. So she actually was out in California, but she informed me of all of these things. And in the book, her name is Kimberly. And in reality, her name is Kimberly. So it's, it's interesting when, you know, it's kind of intimidating just to ask people if you can follow them around or get information from them. But what I've discovered is that people love it because what I think is that, you know, you go home at the end of the day and you talk to your, your family and you start talking about your day and you see their eyes glaze over really quickly but what I did is I followed them around and asked questions about their life and was just fascinated by this. And they're they're thrilled to have somebody interested in what they do. So it was just it's, it, you know, you ask and uh, you get your answers on that. Did you go to the Gardner Museum and talk to them about the heist? That's an interesting question. Um, I made the mistake of going to the Gardner Museum and telling them that I was writing a book about the heist Uh-oh. and they just closed me down. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, this was like 10, 12 years ago now. And uh, they, if I had gone in and said I was writing a book about Bell Gardner, they would have been happy to help me, but they would have nothing to do with it. And when the book came out, it was right after they had done their big edition and my publicist called and said, how about we, you know, we have the launch of this book at the Gardener. It'll be great for everybody. And they yelled at him and they said, <laughs> no, nope, you are taking commercial advantage of the greatest tragedy that has ever occurred here. We will have nothing to do with this book. We will have nothing to do with her, you know, and essentially hung up on him. And that was the case for about a year. And then all these people started coming to the museum because they had read the book and they were asking the docents, where's this picture? Where's this picture? They wanted to know where uh, the Degas in the book had hung, you know, which obviously it hadn't because it didn't exist. And groups were going, busloads of people were going. Um, and eventually they ordered a, a big number of books and sold them in their bookstore. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> wow. Some form of uh, poetic justice there. That's that's very cool. Yeah, they've also changed. They, um, they never wanted to talk about the heist, but I think about 10 years ago they decided that, you know, it was a way that they might find the paintings and they became much more public about it. Yeah, yeah, and they started kind of producing some things yep. about the heist, yep. uh, but they still don't like if you do something about the heist uh, and you're not with them no. already. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's true. It's and, uh, and it's, how you know how, how dare you uh, assume <laughs> assume yeah, that that's that, essentially what they were saying. <laughs> yeah, how and how, how dare how you, dare you? Barbara, assume that people actually went to the museum uh, because they read your book. Uh, that they, they went to the museum because of the gorgeous paintings that hang in that right. museum. That too. <laughs> yes. But no. I got them to go there. <laughs> right. Right. No, I we, I agree. We we <laughs> we do hear from some people who say that as well that they went because of the podcast and uh, but the gardener doesn't want to hear that at all. Right. Right. That's the way it works. I had a moment of panic when I first started uh, reading your book because you describe some artwork as being OTC. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> what is OTC? Over the couch. It's yeah. When people go in to buy artwork that matches their sofa. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a very derogatory term. Um, and artists hate it when people do that, but people do it a lot. Yeah. I had a moment of panic because I laughed at that mo- at that at that line, and then I thought about the painting that's hanging over my sofa. It's nice. <laughs> it is nice, but it's definitely bought to match the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, w- were you contacted by any forgers when your book came out? No, I wish I had. I didn't meet my first forger until after the book came out, uh, and I did uh, a panel. It was in New York City uh, with an art forger, the man who had, who was the head of um, security at the Gardener at the time, and uh, the art forger was a total jerk. <laughs> he was like so impressed with himself for being an art forger uh, that I never really, you know, I couldn't even really talk to him. So in reality, I've never really talked to an art forger. Now, can you, do you think you can spot a forgery? No way. <laughs> <laughs> the experts can't even spot a forgery. Right. Yeah, I know with their new technologies and, and things like that, it's, uh, it's still not uh, right. a given that they're going to find out it's a forgery, huh? No, it's not at all. I wrote down this line here. I, I wrote, does it matter? And it was when you guys were talking about, um, the the you know if if the if the painting is is just as good as the original and people are enjoying it and i wrote down does it matter and then i thought about the stunt or i guess the artistic expression that banksy just recently did by shredding his own art uh, i know in front of the people that are spending millions on it because we were talking about the type of person that buys something and if they if they're willing to spend several million dollars on something and it's a forgery and they're enjoying it does it really matter to us that that this is going on and i just wanted to get your point of view on that <laughs> that moment of expression that that he uh that, <laughs> that he did well you know banksy is not your ordinary artist um and i understand that the people that bought the painting are keeping it shredded that that's that's the painting that they bought. Now it's the famous shredded Banksy. Yeah, yeah. And so it's probably worth money, more money than it would have been if it were just the regular painting that hadn't been shredded. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. I, I absolutely agree. And maybe perhaps because it was only shredded halfway. I think that was actually a fault in, in Banksy's shredder that it didn't shred the entire painting. Oh, um, I didn't realize that. Really? Yeah, mm. yeah. I think he, oh, he intended So they it, can even hang it. Yeah, yeah. He intended it for it to be completely shredded. But well, they was, got it down pretty quick. They, they were probably <laughs> they pulling did. at whatever device was in there <laughs> shredding but, it. But there was I a mean, mechanism you, that broke, I believe. Ah. You do have to love it. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm fascinated that it's worth more now. I think that's yeah. completely compelling. And, I, you know, regard regardless of what his intentions were whether it was a statement on the i guess the the meaning of a piece of art or what people will do for art he's he's laughing all the way through this because uh, yeah. look you just bought my painting it just sold for this this many millions i'm going to shred it right in front of you and you know what you, someone else is going to buy it for more after like that i mean it's it's an incredible statement that he made yeah which is exactly what he was trying to do, but it also gets back to what we were talking about earlier about what gives something value. So he shredded it and it's more valuable. I mean, it's incredible. (laughs) (laughs) And he must've known that was going to happen too, right? Of course he did. Yeah. You know, he's Banksy. (laughs) (laughs) This is his stick. (laughs) So, uh, your book takes place in Boston and I just have one small issue with it. The fact that your main character can run up tabs in in bars and in uh, art stores, I've tried to run up a tab in a bar. And granted, I'm no I'm no artist, but I'm gonna I'm gonna have to call call your bluff on that one. You took a little creative license that a, a Southie bar will be uh, open to uh, taking a tab on shots of tequila. Well, probably the difference between you and Claire is that she is a very attractive young woman. Ah, and, and you are uh, a gross that, old man. And Lance. also, it's a novel. It's fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I needed her to be able to run up tabs because she didn't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's fiction? I'm, I'm at home baking a, a painting right now, and you're telling yeah, me this is right, fiction? Right, right. <laughs> uh, my last question is, uh, if you were to plan an art heist, where would you start? 
where would I start an art heist? Well, I wouldn't start at the gardener, that's for sure. Um, I'd go to some really obscure museum, probably in some small town somewhere in Europe, and set my sights on a single painting and go in at an opportune time and grab it. And just grab it from the wall. Would you take it out of the frame? Mm, Probably not, because that would take too long. Wow. All right. Well, you let us know when that's going to happen. What about a disguise? (laughs) No, you're not going to know when that's going to (laughs) happen. What's your disguise going to look like? Um, maybe I won't need a disguise okay. as I'm, uh, a very innocent looking, uh, woman of a certain age and, um, don't look very suspicious at all. Neither did Jerry and Rita Alter. Okay. There you go. <laughs> and they got away with it <laughs> until, did. until the day they died. Yep. Behind the door. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. This was uh, wonderful talking to you and uh, it was a really fun conversation. So uh, everyone listening out yeah. there, please pick up The Art Forger by B.A. Shapiro. Wonderful read. Here's to elusive and morality. The Collector's Apprentice. Yes. Yes. The Collector's Apprentice. Check out your other catalog too. the rest of your catalog of books <laughs> and visit the Gardner Museum and tell them Barbara sent you. <laughs> And tell them Empty Frame sent you, too.